Good morning. I would uh, like to begin by thanking Ricardo, uh, Luigi, and Elan for organizing this symposium and for inviting me as a guest speaker. As uh, Ricardo was saying, I'm a composer and a professor of computer music and video. And uh, I have been making image and sound composition for the past 25 years or so. It's a lot more than a few years. Uh, I have titled this talk, This Is Not Cinema, because frankly, even after all this time, it's still complicated to explain where my work falls on the great divide of sensory experiences. In recent years, there's been an explosion of activity in audiovisual creation. Hundreds, if not thousands, of new videos, from abstracted doodles to narrative long forms, are created and presented on YouTube and Vimeo every day, every week, every month, perhaps. And festivals touting a new sort of visual and music expression and or performance are held everywhere as more and more artists find their way around the new tools that make this kind of expression possible. Another very welcome fact in this is that this is a worldwide activity. And now it's taken place everywhere in India, it's taken place in the Middle East, it's taken place in Latin America, and thankfully it's not anchored in Western cultural traditions and institutions anymore. I think this is a very important point. Uh, it has been said that the 19th century was the century of music, that the 20th century was the century of visual arts, and if that is true, surely the 21st century will be that of audiovisuality. And as this activity develops, there is a new urgency for gatherings uh, like this one to take place, if only, as the title of the symposium says, to understand what all this furious activity is all about. Um, in the first part of the conference uh, yesterday, the, there were a uh, uh, present first presentation session in the morning, it was very uh, indicative of a certain malaise in that the, uh, the word music was very, very seldom used and said. And uh, today, from what I understand, it's quite different. And I would like to ask, I mean, how many people here are uh, define music as their main activity, as their driving activity, let's say? OK, how about uh, film and media activity? Okay, so so I'm I'm this this will make my my talk. A lot of the things I will bring out will probably resonate a lot easier with with all of you than it would have it would have otherwise. But uh, in any case, I come from the music end of things, and I call myself a composer, and a composer I shall remain. From our side of things, the view can be dramatically different, and I want to share some ideas about audiovisuality that I have developed over the past couple of decades. I will talk of how working with music and working with image are similar and different. I will offer some pointed critiques on the issues of synchronicity, and I'm not the only one to, uh, who will have done that, and image parametric equivalency, what I call parametric equivalency, which uh, Fabian talked about and uh, a number of other people have talked about. In my conclusions, I hope to shed a modest light on uh, where I believe this is all going. And some may not agree with what I have to say, but let me assure you that uh, whatever blessings or prescriptions I bring forth relate to no one else's work but my own. And I think that diverging, uh, diverging opinions are always welcome. So, um, uh, theories of cinema and theories of new media have begun to account for this new kind of audiovisual hybrid. But this has been almost exclusively through the film and new media track, where it is common to relegate the audio component to its traditional support role in the audiovisual experience and make the language of the image the main object of study. Curiously, a critique of audiovisuality originating from the music side of things is rather rare, with the glaring exceptions, of course, of the writings of Michel Chion, who was a noted music concrete composer. However, even Chion writes about, about sound in the traditional context of cinema, and while his ideas are extremely helpful for analyzing and critiquing the, uh, the new audiovisuality, he does not really consider the new image sound hybrids under a different light. Most trained musicians are aware of composer Alexandre Scriabin's exploration into the visualization of pitch classes with colored lights. 
A number of machines were developed to explore these connections, notably the color organ, and the, which was a bank of colored lights linked to a keyboard of sorts and played by a color organist. Scriabin was not the first to research these correspondences between light and sound, but he was one of the first to really test his ideas. These experiments culminated with the performance of Prometheus and the famed Luce part in New York City in 1915, where there was an orchestra and there was a color organist and the color lights were shown. This particular approach is loosely based on synesthesia, in my opinion. It's a rare, this rare mental capability of internally seeing colors when hearing non stimuli. Other composers, such as Olivier Messiaen, have discussed synesthesia, but it is worthy of note that most artists who have further explored this idea came from the visual arts, animation, and experimental film. Oscar Fischinger, John Whitney, Stan Brackage, Norman McLaren, and Woody Bazooka, amongst others, are names hardly known in music circles, and yet visual music is most often used to describe their work. I am not a filmmaker, I am not a video artist, even though my biography, old biography says I was, I am not a visual, uh, video artist, and for the most part I don't make music videos. First and foremost, I am a composer. I make works that use electronic imagery and electronic sound, but my training and my source of expression is music, first and foremost. I started my adventures in visuals by working with visual and video artists, but soon graduated to creating my own imagery out of the conviction that if a true union of image and sound was to be achieved, the work needed to be formed in the crucible of the same mind. Even if I did silent videos, I would still call myself a musician. To me, outside their individual sensory paths, both components, image and sound, are the same. One is rarely the physical representation of the other, but they aim to be experienced in the same unified discourse. Yes. For this reason, I believe we have a taxonomy problem. Personally, for the work I do, and a good number of works that were seen here and elsewhere, the term visual music is not the correct one. If one considers the literature and the type of public presence it has received over the years and a good part of the interested parties in this very conference, visual music issues from experimental cinema, animation, or in Germany, they also call it absolute film. It boasts a, ri it boasts a rich history and a wide variety of practitioners of whom surprisingly few are musicians. In most cases, the filmmaker, animator, is the principal creator, and the music, as in cinema, acts in a supporting role, even if the underlying structural devices of holding up the work is thought out with a musical sensibility through rhythms, overlays, colors, and form. In the two events we have seen so far, what was seen and heard couldn't be more different. Some works were the object of a screening, and some other works were the object of a concert. And I believe this is a very important distinction. What differentiates the two is the ascendancy of the musical component and its role in leading the perceptual experience. Now, unless there's a wide agreement to divorce the term visual music from its, its historical roots, it is difficult to use it for practices where increasingly music is the driving me medium and the moving images are executed by the composer or under the direction of the composer. The, canon the canonical creators of visual music, like Hans Richter, uh, John Whitney, Len Leist, and Brackage, they are all executed their work with the ambition of attaining the purity of musical, musical expression, unencumbered with iconicity and the distracting weight of narrative. Form, color, movement, like in all music, were the building blocks of their aesthetic expertise. But they were not musicians. And this very much matters when trying to articulate an informed critique of their work and the work of their disciples, past, present, and future. I'm certain many of you will find it tiresome to open up yet another branch in the terminological chaos that afflicts the visual and the media and the performing arts. This terminology impasse affecting the new audiovisual hybrids are discon is disconcerting, pun intended. <laughs> Over the years, a number of proposals have been made to delineate the marriage of moving, uh, moving visuals and, and music outside narrative, whether in film, video, electronic, or instrumental music. 
synesthetic art, Lumia, music video, light music, color music, visual music, video music, and the more recent audiovisual composition. These were all attempts of defining what, is, what this odd beast really is. And lately, though, visual music seems to be uh, to become more and more accepted, as witness the uh, title of this, the present symposium. Now, visual music can be different things to different practitioners, of course. But the canonical, the canonical examples of the field are generally concerned with the representation move of movement assembled using logic, the logic of musical discourse without the acoustical underpinnings that make music music. As we have seen in the IOTA presentation yesterday, this pre representation all, all often goes through abstracted geometri geometrical uh, imagery and presents movement of light, shape, and colors anchored to the unfolding <coughs> musical soundtrack, sometimes with a nod to synchronization, just as often not. In my collaborations with uh, video artist Tom Sherman in the late 80s, we coined the appellation video music for the work we were doing. This largely came from the fact that Tom and I were accepting of the equal contribution of the other in making the final piece. For a while, this, the term seemed to gain traction to underline the ascendancy of music in, in the aesthetic hierarchy of the works. I still cling to that name, and I hope to convince some of you of its relevance. I think this form, in its multiple mediated manifestations, will develop into one of the most important media for ex of expression for the decades to come. I will attempt here to explain, explain why I believe this. I will also attempt to define a few guideposts for the form. I wish to examine some of these attempts and, and oh, I'm sorry. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that happens. Computer editing. So, all right. Similitude, same and different. What's the same and what's different? in image and sound. Well, I'm going to start with some personal examples. And the, the first audiovisual work that I did was a live performance with video artist jo Jody Gilliman in 1982. Uh, Jody was working with Dan Sandine in Chicago, and some of you may know who Dan Sandine is. He, uh, he developed the analog IP processor, the image processor, which is uh, essentially uh, a machine with the machinery he developed uh, along with his colleague Tom DeFonte, was very similar to Robert Moog's uh, analog audio synthesizer, having very various video modules connected together to compose a more and more complex chain of image processing. At the time, I had a Fairlight sampler, and uh, I organized an analog interface between the two machines to control the IP video switcher with the music sequencer. Now, the earlier machines, machines built for video processing, were almost copied on the, on the patch paradigm already common for sound synthesis. Marrying the two was natural in a real-time performative environment, like analog machinery tends to perform in real time and tends to express itself in real time. Now, uh, the, uh, the, the piece was presented at SIGGRAPH that year, and uh, after that, I, I more or less dropped out of, of this particular uh, in, uh, type of collaboration uh, involving analog video synthesis because I felt that the imaging possibilities of analog video synthesizers were very much limited and soon uh, fell into a subcategory of predictable effects. And uh, I, I, I want to come back to the wonderful examples that uh, Jean Gagnon played, uh, the work of Stein and Basulka, uh, which was the, in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, and, and to say that, that um, the, the, the predictable effects were very much linked to the technology. And uh, at the time, there could only be one Stein of Vesulka uh, because one would have had to invent a whole new technology to get different results. The oscilloscope signal, the Elisajou figure, is always going to be a Lissajou figure. It's never going to be anything else. And uh, therefore, at that point, uh, I thought it was too limiting, and uh, I concentrated on doing music. But what stayed with me in this is that there's, it's very, it was very easy to transpose the, the, the workflow and the ergonomics of day-to-day of -day work from the work I was already doing in audio, transpose it to video, uh, 
to video creation. It was a, it was a direct, really a direct uh, uh, translation, not in the content, not in what not in what the products were, but in the in the in the gestures that one would have to make in order to produce the results that uh, you want to produce as an artist. And I think this is this is uh, this is a very important point, and. Um, so, um, uh, uh, on the other hand, along with uh, computer power, things are changing rapidly. I mean, I've abandoned it, but now it has changed. And uh, audiovisual performance is again becoming a distinct possibility without having to make the painful aesthetic compromises and sacrifices due to bandwidth limitation. <coughs> it's also important, I think, we're going to see a resurgence of audiovisual performance because the, the tools are actually allowing us to do it much better. Now, my collaborations with Tom Sherman were a series of fixed media audiovisual works. Working in the 80 year old video editing suite at the time, in the, this was in the, in the late 80s, uh, it was immediately obvious to me that the process of producing electronic moving images in the studio was formally identical to producing electronic music in the studio. So again, there was this, this, this setting of how you make the work and for image and for sound. The various mm -hmm. stages of production were similar. Uh, there was the capturing and or the synthesizing of materials with the microphone or with the camera. There was, and the second step, there was the organizing, the processing, and the manipulation of materials into classes and variations. And finally, the editing on the timeline of the final composition. You could ask uh, a composer of electroacoustic music in 1988 and a video artist working in video in 1988, they were both doing the same thing, essentially. Ergonomically, they were doing the same thing. So, when I first made my own video, video music piece as a composer of computer music, I felt immediately comfortable in the video production environment. Whether similarities were evident then, they became much more, even more pronounced with the gradual introduction of computer-based editing and processing hardware and software. Beyond the workflow itself, both media and are, manip are now manipulated with tools that are ergonomically almost identical. And this, the point I'm trying to make here uh, is a lot more important than it would first appear. Uh, artists make things with tools. These tools have an extremely pernicious influence on shaping the objects made with them. Mm -hmm. Extremely pernicious. As tools deal with more and more complex tasks, the hardware software designer looms larger and larger as an important determinant mm -hmm. of what we see and hear as new and important. Mm -hmm. So, electroacoustic music is an abstraction of a very particular kind. Its very matter is manufactured and transformed in the studio. In the same way, video editing and image processing manufacture the, the visual experience. As electroacoustic music was born through the confrontation of musical thinking with radio technologies, video art was born from the confrontation of the visual arts with the technologies of television. I know that a lot of uh, art uh, theoreticians would not agree with this, but nonetheless, that's... that's uh, I see something something uh, 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 similar here. So digital technologies have now brought these two practices together into a new hybrid that shares similar organizational principles and the same production paradigm. Be that as it may, I believe that the possibilities of new technologies very often precede their exploitation for artistic and expressive purposes, which is to say that I'm looking forward to the release of audiovisual software <coughs> that facilitates the creation of audiovisual content on a unified platform. Very exciting. All right, uh, not the same. I want to talk now how, so, so this particular thing, the way of doing in image and in sound, in music, are now almost identical. And I think this is very important. It, it doesn't have to do with content, it doesn't have to do with language, it doesn't have to do with the art itself in the end, but it has to do with how we do the work. Now, what's not the same? Uh, visualizing music is a seductive proposition that harks back to the very beginnings of sound image associations. This holy grail of total per perception predates cinema by centuries, 
and truly dies hard in the minds of many artists. We have seen much of this in the works presented yesterday. Allow me to uh, be reductive for a moment and go back to the example of the square attached to the sound. Now we've heard a lot about this and we've seen a lot about that. So the sound's pitch can directly, uh, would directly affect the position of the square on the projection surface. The amplitude of the sound would determine the, uh, the, the size of the square. And the tan of the sound would translate into the size of the, uh, it would translate uh, into the color of the, of the square. Now mapping strategies are paramount in obtaining a coherent matchup and artists have devised more and more elaborate matrices for this kind of correspondences. This sort of work used to be extremely labor intensive and to my ears and eyes anyways, often awkward in its attempt to present one medium as an illustration or the embodiment of the other. From Scriabin's color organ uh, to Lissajou oscillosc oscilloscope figures, there have been countless technologically driven attempts to automatically, to automatically solving this problem, this conundrum. John Whitney thought that the, this equivalency would be solvable with digital technology. And surely there's some truth to that. However, it is nearly impossible not to see the topological consequences of fitting one sensory data set into another one. Is the sum of image and sound stimuli articul articulated in time in the same manner an added value to the work? Is it the very point of the work? Even with new software mappings and high-performance computers, can it, will it lead to anything more than an advanced Mickey Mousing aesthetic? <laughs> now, I use this, the term uh, Mickey Mousing here. It's not, uh, it's not pejorative as, as, uh, as it may sound. It's actually a term that's used in film theory to uh, uh, that, uh, um, well, I'll talk about this a little bit later on, but it's not, uh, I'm not using this in a pejorative way. Uh, repetition, therefore, in the form of imitation or simulacra is a low information carrier. Image is more than form and music. is more than form and light, just as music is more than sound. If the aesthetic goal is to perform, is to develop an audiovisual form based on parametrical analysis of a purely abstract construct, that's music, and translated to imagery or vice versa, the tools to do so are or will be available, and a direct synth synthetic translation of sound to image is really feasible. But Formal grammatical and syntactical mappings of sound parameters to light parameters is likely impossible or vice versa. Sound and light are simply at heart different animals. The aesthetic prospects of such abstracted correspondences remain suspect as they do not leave enough room for metaphor. This evocative and expressive space between hardcore reality and suggestive extrapolation. In the end, the successful partnership of sound and image is an integrated signal, as an inter integrated signal, rests on whether the viewer-listener buys the illusion. Michel Chion calls this the audiovisual contract, and its most remarkable manifestation is still in film, sound, and music, where the relationship of sound and image runs the full gamut between synchrosis and uh, of, uh, synchrosis of sound effects. This is the Mickey Mouse thing they were talking about, to the detached contrapuntal commentary to elevate the narrative, and that is the role of film music. So this brings us to, oh, I think I skipped one of those. Yes. This brings us to what I would consider the most pernicious theoretical construct christened by Michel Schoen as synchrosis. Take away timbre, pitch, and amplitude, sound becomes pure time and rhythm. This is quite different than the parametric equivalency we just talked about. Realistically, time is the only absolute par parameter that moving images and music share. Synchronized perception of sound and image is therefore the most powerful signifier in audiovisual discourse. Most of you already know this, but let me recap. Synchrosis is what happens when a visual and auditory stimulus, stimulus are presented together. 
and are perceived by the viewer listener as being the same thing, as emanating from the same source, or as having a direct causal relationship. Synchrosis does not establish parametric correspondences between image and sound, except that of origin. This is deceptively simple, but if one wanted to construct a speculative grammar for audiovisuality, this is where it begins. Some film theory called synchrosis, calls synthesis Mickey Mouse things, I would say. In reference to the very tight integration of sound to animation in early Walt Disney animated films, and it is sometimes considered derisively as a seductive trick that, com that comforts the imagination of movie audiences. However, there is no denying the profound satisfaction of synchronicity. But if synchrosis is essential in anchoring visual and auditory stimuli as being the same thing, its redundant use is easily harmful to an, ex an expressive discourse. This is the thesis defended by the contrapuntal school of film sound, which includes Eisenstein and the Russian constructivists. An exploding sound presented together with a red sphere suddenly disintegrating adds no information to the experience, if only to make it more evident and help identify some of the physical physical qualities of the red sphere. For me, the creative and exploratory usage of synchrosis should aim at exploring metaphoric rather than causal relationship. This is a difficult one to explain. I mean, where does metaphor sit and what does it consist of? I'm not really sure. Uh, uh, Yark uh, uh, did go into that uh, quite a bit, and I think he, he's onto something very interesting for that. We can certainly discuss it later. But the um, uh, um, so therefore, yes, by relying too much on the synchronized ab abs abstraction, <coughs> excuse me, I, I sidetracked myself. Let me hear so. so the exploding sound, uh, uh, okay, for me, the creative and exploratory usage of synchronization should aim at exploring metaphoric rather than causal relationship. By relying too much on synchronized abstraction, musical, uh, visual music fails too easily, it falls too easily into a sort of adaptive psychedelia without formal or structural meaning. Synchrosis should thus be used with parsimony as a mean to anchor the perception of a unitary experience, not as a visual representation of the matter of music. Detachment and contrary motion often occupy a higher aesthetic place. Yes. Um, okay. Second perceptual trap. Iconicity, narrative, and poetry. The same critique as above uh, for the synthesis, the same critique can be leveled at pure abstraction, time, whether it's time synchronous or not. It would be reasonable to think that an expressly abstract form, music, can only be married to visual abstraction in order to retain some of the formal purity of purpose. But I believe that the enormous benefits of representational visuals, if only to expand the expressive latitude or the compose of the composer, should be uh, looked at. The use of non-abstracted visuals leads to a host of new opportunities and difficulties. The rub here is that when there is a recognizable image, recognizable object, there is an implicit narrative. I use the image of an apple, for example, that in, as soon as I show you an apple, it comes with all the cognitive implications of the apple. Its taste, its texture, the memories it stimulates, etc. Thus, we are led to cinema and the direct personal implication of representational imagery. The associations emanating from objects cause an immediate separation between their physical manifestations and the world of human lives and experiences. And that's the magic of, and the magic power of cinema lies in this reality flip. As the story and narrative of the movie unfolds, we forget that we're looking at what we're looking at and what we're listening to. We become an integral part of the cinematic experience. Image, sound, dialogue, music, everything is brought together to service the narrative purpose of cinema. Music, on the other hand, involves it in a different way, in a much more deta detached mode. We become lost in it as well, but this immersion goes through the very matter that constitutes music, the sound that constitutes music. In the movies, we get transported by representation mediated through matter. Narrative is cinema. 
while music is an experience of pure time without the stumbling inconvenience of a story. This leads many to conclude that film music, at its best, should always be an emotional sound effect and should never expire to do more, aspire to do more than supporting the purpose of the narrative. There are a number of, cin of narrative cinematic, cinematic works where music occupies a primary place, if only because they were made in the silent film area, era. Abel Gans's Napoleon, Fritz Lang's Metropolis, and of course, Ziga Vertov's Man with the Movie Camera, are the best known and are still being rescored by different composers today. The latter was a precursor to what is likely to me the defining moment of contemporary audiovisual composition, Jeffrey Riggio's and Philip Glass's monument of the groundbreaking Koyaniskati. This work, along the lines of Vertov's work, defines a new genre perhaps, perhaps best uh, qualified as semi-narrative -narr and semi-documentary because it breaks the explicit linear unfolding of a story and indulges a perceptual carnival where form, sound, color, and movement are the main characters. It makes its points through the immediate power of its music and its images, and I note, it very, very rarely uses synchronicity, except in a very sublimated way. So. Um, so I want to talk about a little bit about uh, where uh, where I think this is going, and, and some of the stuff that that hasn't been talked about so far. And uh, uh, the first one is that uh, I'm surprised that there hasn't been uh, very much talk unless it happened in some of the, the talks that I missed about music videos. And this is a bit surprising because shouldn't we consider music videos as a good example of coherent audiovisual discourse? Beyond con commercial considerations, some efforts by and for artists like York, Peter Gabriel, Michel Gondry, and Chris Cunningham, my age is showing here, <laughs> have undeniably pushed the form to excellence. <coughs> Despite the disposable allure, uh, the, their disposable allure, they were the first to explore a f new way of communicating musically with images, and they have now been doing this for over half a, cent over half a century. One can recall the later film clips of the Beatles from the end of their career when the visual presence was deemed essential for marketing purposes, when the musicians were, had stopped performing publicly. It became quickly obvious to the producers that the simple performance documentary was not enough to represent the musical adventure proposed by the Beatles. Borrowing from psychedelia and experimental cinema came all those surrealist, numerous scenes going far beyond the normal narrative framework used for such documents. Perhaps accidentally, pop music has provided an entirely new model for combining music to a free music visual interpretation. The wealth of music video now supports an entire television industry, and this is where the most important resources are brought to bear on making image and music work together. This is a significant point. There's, there's, uh, it is uh, the, the, the complexity of, of, of images come at a price and very often it's for an independent artist it's almost impossible to do. Uh, you, if you're, if you're a, a composer such as myself trying to do uh, stuff that, that's visually extremely complicated I, I just cannot afford it. And this is, uh, this is where uh, uh, music videos because of the commercial imperative are able to experiment and do things that we wouldn't be able to do. Yes, so uh, uh, using in turn pure visual effects, forms, objects, human characters, and stage dramatic settings or documentary representation, the best music videos have defined an oniric universe where music not only replaces dialogue but becomes the very reason for their existence. This paradigm is very seductive. Music is undeniably its main content, and the images are, for the most part, organized to serve the music's purpose, whatever this purpose may be. Synchrosis is used as a structure and building block, but often with moderation. In combining the surrealist nature of the subject, accessory narrative, and the wild imagination of visual discourse, the utilitarian and commercial aim of, the music, of music videos should not detract from its genuinely rich associations of image and sound outside common cinematic narrative. VJ culture. And we have a wonderful talk yesterday about 
its origin. And um, I'm learning a lot of things. Thank you. <laughs> uh, computer music, about, I'll attack from a different angle. The uh, computer music was cleverly combined with pop music in the late 80s and early 90s and gave birth to techno. Maybe can argue it's maybe the early 80s, actually. Arguably, a dis the techno was an arguably a disposable musical genre of instant gratification made possible by very user friendly technology and the ever growing dance party scene. While DJs and laptop performers of various persuasions were busily reappropriating sounds and tools developed by others for other purposes, addressing the lack of performance wasn't far behind, and DJs made their entrance into electron the electronica scene very early on, using, for the most part, fairly crude means like VHS, VHS tape players and analog switchers, emulating the light shows of the psychedelic 60s and much to the same step. But a computer clock rate, as computer clock rates increase, these activities have become more and more sophisticated, even if most of the material is still presented in an improvisator, improvisatory and unstructured fashion. Pulsing lights remains the message in this practice. I, I accept to be contradicted on this. It's not <laughs> necessarily the truth, but that's the way I know it. And so at its worst, it's the perfect vehicle for an epilepsy episode. <laughs> and, uh, at its best, it is uh, a visually enthralling poetry fit for the new century bacchanalias. <laughs> Be that as it may, it is now the norm for all performing pop acts to stage elaborate visual accompaniments for their show. <coughs> when it isn't a straight projection of the performance on giant monitors for the benefit of far-flung stadium, stadium audiences, it is the presentation of the band's latest vi music videos or the concoctions of a visual musicians with a fast disc array of prepared images. Now, the appearance of VJing as an important billing on popular entertainment points to a phenomenon that I believe will only get more and more important. Music and video are our components of a larger artistic form one could generically call time-based expression, time-based art. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go into that because that's a whole that's a whole kettle of fish on itself. So but we'll go. Another, and uh, another uh, side track here is that uh, there's another development that will soon bring us to an altogether new direction, new direction in performative audiovisuals. Technology is fast evolving in the direction of live generated and processed visuals. We've seen a lot. We've seen a lot of things, and Max and Jitter, and 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 and, uh, and processing, and so on and so forth. There are a lot of platforms that are coming together now that allow you to give more and more uh, uh, complex visuals in real time. We're not quite there yet, as far as as far as I'm concerned, anyways. The, the quality of the image is not really quite there, but it's it's going to happen. And and because of the of the most the more modest computational bandwidth demands, live performance has been a domain of computer music for decades now. So as a musician, we know how to organize stuff in real time and actually play it. Uh, the, the, the VJs do it in a different way, in a, in a much more crude fashion. And, and, it's, uh, and this is likely what's going to change. And, and I want to go back to something uh, that Adrian said that uh, I'm not sure I understood it correctly. You can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. But uh, the, the, the one thing that we haven't talked very much about here is gesture. Because all this comes down to gesture in the end. And, uh, uh, you know, when you see a violinist play the violin, you don't have to have really, really big visual cues to know that he's doing the sound, and the vibrato is actually his finger controlling it. And uh, the problem with electronic music, of course, and electronic visuals is that there's no, that relationship does not exist. You can, you cannot look, I can take the computer and put any, any piece of software in it and any piece of interaction with the keyboard and sliders and so on and so forth. And, you know, chances are that, that, that the relationship is not that clear. The, the, the one, uh, the, the acoustic relationship is a given and we see it immediately and that's why performance of music is performance of music. So gesture comes into it at one point and uh, uh, the, the, the by adding a, a powerful live, I just don't want to get lost here. I'm, I'm improvising a little bit here, so I, I want to bring it back. The, uh, by adding a powerful live imagery uh, generation capabilities, it will open up yet another field of artistic uh, intervention, intervention depth, namely that of gesture. And not far behind, and something that we also have not talked about very much in this conference, is dance. Mm -hmm. And dance is. Uh, 
as far as, as translating sound to, to movement and to visuals, you can't get any closer than dance. It's, it's the embodiment of the, of the, uh, of the there's, a, there's a German company, a dance company, I forget their name now, uh, that I saw uh, uh, quite a while ago, that specialized in the actual, very precise translation of the musical lines, the movement. Is it palindrome? What's that? Palindrome? Does it mean that? Palindrome? It's, it's, it was in the 80s. What, what, what song? I don't know. It was in the 80s. <laughs> Not well, in any well, case, well. it was it was dance, and and the lines you could literally follow the lines of the piano and in, in the Schubert, and and they would make the movement like uh -huh. this, and it stuck to it, you know, very precisely. It was extremely <laughs> convincing. So, uh, hopefully, this is coming back, and when this comes back, uh, it ties into VJing and it ties into the music performance. Uh, this is where I think the most interesting stuff is going to come from because performance will become real performance and it's not going to be fake performance and what we have now in audiovisuals, I'm sorry to say, most of the time it's fake performance. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in laptop performances. It's <laughs> just not. It's yeah. just not it. And so, um, you know, be that as it may, uh, that's it. I'm going to uh, <laughs> close on, on, uh, on talking about this ties into the work that I do and, and uh, my my uh, personal implication with, with all this, and really essentially this is all this is what matters to me, is that uh, video music, and this is what I call what I do, um, uh, video music proposes an extension of the music video concept towards a form that is more ambitious, taking it closer to cinema in its scope, but remaining music at its score. Video music is a form where fine art music takes the front stage and remains the central content of the work. Video music makes full use of all digital means of production for both image and sound and will, as technology and purpose allows, explore ways of integrating parametric control of image and sound, <coughs> and like imi image from sound and sound from image and vice versa. The public place to me of, of to me, the public place of video music is the concert. It is a concert with or without performers where the work is presented in optimum listening and viewing conditions. Video music is also defined by the absence of a determining narrative, and herein lies its major difference from cinema. It pretends to sensorial poetry. If cinema is an audiovisual novel, video music is, an audio is audiovisual poetry. Cinema uses words to structure the work, the video music, the music, and the image of the structure and components. You know, it's, its open form allows for an unshackled exploration of the magical, the phantasmagorical, and perhaps gives us an opening towards that old screaming quest, music becoming images. Maybe we have time for a couple of questions only. I'd like to hear you uh, go a bit more about the. You talk about gesture, so it means instruments. Yes. And yes. so. And you know that at McGill, there's a lot of... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. That's their oh, yeah, no, I'm... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So could you elaborate a bit more? Well, it's, it's not really the purpose of my talk, but it, because, I mean, I'm not there yet. Because the, I believe that the, 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 the basis needed to... The, the technological basis needed to properly articulate gesture into sound and image is not there yet. No, I, I, may, I may be mistaken. Maybe there's some, some stuff that's being done. There's research that's being done. I'm busy doing something else, and I'm going to probably adapt to it when it comes. But there's no doubt in my mind that it will happen. Mm -hmm. And it will happen. Is it going to be, you know, it, it will happen on the basis of what we know. What we know from the visual music experience, from the, video, the, 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 the visual music, video music, and all the, all the, the, the attempts of, of tying the two together historically. So obviously it's going to develop from there. And where do, where will the new tool, the new tools allow us to go? I think this is the most important thing. You know, I was talking about the way of doing. 
uh, the way of doing will generate whatever uh, art there is to generate from gesture to to uh, to uh, to sound an image. Uh, it's the it's the, the it's the means that are going to indicate where we can go. Uh, this is a, a lot of people will disagree with that, and I understand why they will disagree. Uh, was, uh, we don't have too much time, was Alan first. Yeah, you haven't talked about uh, aesthetic. Yeah, I just want to underline the fact that, uh, for example, we have two streams, you know, the, the music, musicians, and visual arts, you know. More and more musicians are making images now, and more and more visual artists are making sound yeah. or music. Yeah. But the musicians, as because I'm mostly into, let's say, in digital arts, we pick up sure. the, the good things in both. But uh, uh, what I can see is the musicians doesn't really know what's happening in visual arts. Mm -hmm. yeah. And maybe the yeah. same. So uh, they are both very this critical really of uh, yeah. each other. So yeah. what do you think about this? Uh, well, it, it's, it's, uh, it's an odd thing. I mean, uh, the... Uh, um, and uh, you know, since I teach this, and I've been teaching this for quite a few years, it's very rare to find someone who has the sensibility and the information to do both at the same time. I acknowledge that. However, I have noticed that this is starting to change. That people who are coming in who have started doing art with uh, technological means are usually more aware of what's happening on both on both sides of the of the mm -hmm. of the, the media edifice. As, uh, as it were, but but you're you're quite right. I mean, very often, you know, I, I have a student that will start to do a video music piece and will present me with a visual thing that's just you know completely out to lunch. But it, you know, uh, it's that's how you learn and that's how you do it. And and it's very difficult to acquire all the knowledge that you have to have in terms of art history, music history, counterpoint video editing, uh, you, you know, uh, script writing and so on and so forth. It takes a long, long time. And, and uh, But I think, uh, you know, we have lots of time. <laughs> <laughs> we have time only for two more, Xing Wei and Dennis, and we need to stop. And we, we will have, I don't know if you're going to be in the afternoon, we will have oh, yeah, some yeah. time after that. Yeah, yeah. Chance to have yeah. Yeah. So, Xing Wei, Dennis, and we need to stop. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Shinwa is going to be uh, he's gonna be a <laughs> challenge to answer. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> it's all sympathetic. I, I have to thank you so much for yeah. making these remarks that basically only people have enough stuff to say and not, you know, go down the flames for saying these things that we all say, but we yeah. don't have the courage to say. And yeah. that's yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much. Uh, and yes, I think I'd like to say that I think there is uh, there's a lot of interesting work in this kind of synthesis from the domain of, of movement. I was thinking halfway through your talk that uh, it would be nice to have some people from the dance department, in particular, for example, Michael Montanaro, who's very busy right yeah, now yeah, in yeah. the lab and is sure. uh, working with people trying to bring Yeah, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a death neglected. Hey, absolutely. Actually. And yeah. one of the things that Michael said to me years ago when he first came to Concordia was that he was he was working in Arizona, I was working with people like 10, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. He's very disappointed with the kind of literalness, again, the kind of parametric uh, equivalency also in the domain of working with uh, uh, the advanced technologies of the time. So when we started working together five, six years ago, over that time, we've been looking at this kind of synthesis as possible, non-narrative synthesis kind of work. Which you say, you're saying synthesis? A synthesis in okay. the sense of the way you pointed to film, yeah. uh, the abstract film work, okay. which, which, which allows kind of poetic metaphoric relationship between different kinds of time-based media. Very interesting. And it is happening in them. I won't talk about that. I'm just saying that what's interesting is that there's some questions, which are very hard questions. Adrian's also very expert in this kind of thing with working with people like David Bustle, people who are working in cinema. Fine. Um, I think it's maybe more advanced than one might think. Uh, there are some interesting examples. Uh, in terms of research, Lisa Weimar at Berkeley is a new uh, dance professor at yeah. Berkeley. She's been working on distributed, you know, cinematic this and that. But really, we don't, they don't need all that you know, high resolution projection if you want to talk about presence yeah. or synchronicity or rather contrapuntal contra work between the two moving bodies. What is the sense that one body moving with another body has a sense of the other dancer? Yeah. Sense means to, to be developed, right? Yeah. Uh, so we've been looking at works for shadow, for example, or, or the impressions of shadow, the, or the temporal qualities of shadow. And that's enough to start. We don't need the 50 strings. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so things could be done yeah, I understand given that. the limited, you know, the, the, and I in fact, 
your land is very interesting because it's so rich. I mean, we talked before about what could happen if, if maybe choreographers could have access to that kind of richness that's right. already in the right. site, right. maybe right. doing experiments in such a situation. Right. No, I, no I, I really don't mean to... Uh, to uh, I'm, I'm talking about... Oh dear, how can I put this? Uh, experimentalism uh, uh, is something that you know, obviously, obviously, uh, uh, it's the leading edge of, of where things are going and so on. And I know that a lot of things do exist, but for me, I want. Uh, I'm 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 an old guy, so I, I, I it tradi it's very traditional in that sense, and it's it's very conservative. I mean, no 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 offense to anyone. Uh, I'm not politically conservative. I've been saying in terms of, I'm very um, um, I'm very concerned with fineness. Mm -hmm. I'm very concerned with, uh, with, with. I don't want to say craft because it's not really craft we're talking about. I'm talking about how, through the, the representation, through the images, through the sound, do you communicate this fineness? Now it may be hidden, and it might, it might be you know hidden in the gesture. It can be. There's all kinds of ways of doing that. But for video music and what I do, I really need that really fine grain in order to to do something. And uh, so I'm waiting. I'm just, I'm just kind of waiting and seeing what's going to happen. I agree. I think it's too yeah. coarse right now because yeah. the theatrical yeah. condition also means that it doesn't have to be so fine. Yes, no, of course. Of course. So we're talking about a meter distance. Absolutely. Which we have yeah. the, the last uh, yeah. question for Dennis. Yeah, um, John, thank you for the great talk. I'm just curious why you choose to align yourself or see yourself in the continuum of music video as opposed to more traditional visual music. I mean, I, seeing your work yesterday, it, it seems so much closer to Fischinger and really? than anything I've ever seen on okay. MTV, which I admit is limited. Um, yeah. the, the, the music videos always have a performance. Yeah. A performance. I mean, it's a, well, it, it is a performance, uh, again, in my experience. And so where, why video music, you know, rather than visual music because all of your definitions seem to fit in because of the historical connotations and the historical preoccupations of visual music as it developed from from the, the constructivists and the Dada movement and the mm -hmm. futurists and so on and so forth. That's why to me visual music remains branded as a visual arts term. It's it it's not mu it, well it's music. I mean if you, if you want to stretch the definition of what music is it's music transposed visually. That's not what I do. It's really not what I do, and it's really different. Well, maybe some people will say it's not different, but I, it's it's uh, to me it is because I'm a composer. I really am a composer. I think stuff sonically. Yeah, sure. The stuff that you saw uh, yesterday in my piece is, uh, it, of course, I don't you know I don't say well the pitch is going to be this little ball here and it's going to be that and so on and so forth. But I mean the general drive of the of the work is anchored in what I have to say musically. Oh, I get that. I get yeah. that. It just it seems to me that more work is coming. Yeah. I mean, hi historically it has come from visual artists yeah. uh, adopting music for their purposes. I, I think there is more work coming from the music side adopting visuals. For the yeah. Same. Yeah. I Obviously. think absolutely it's changed. You yeah. know, uh, yeah. This conference is a definition of that. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. Have no, no, happy that there are mostly and musicians. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's, yeah. It was not yesterday so I thought, surprising. oh. Yeah, that's, <laughs> no, that's the point. It's yeah. just because just... No one owns that tournament. Can you play something that's changed? So I'm very, I'm very, uh, very happy that what it, that's what he did. And look, I'm, I'm, I'm happy and open to to revise the views on on, on taxonomy, but open a book on this stuff anywhere, and it's experimental cinema theory. Well, uh, Brian Evans has written extensively from the musician's perspective, extremely well. For those of you who don't, I'm know. not saying it doesn't exist. Yeah, I'm not saying that some people are not doing important work that way. And right. and, and Brian is an example. There's countless sure. other examples. Yeah, but mostly. I go guess, talk, do visual music and in, in Google visual music and see what comes out. Yeah. Uh, at 1.30 we have the third from this show. Saturated visual music.